Testing? There we go. I erred. <laughs> anyway, praise God for the beautiful day we have before us. Thank you for having me here again. Jordan Canaan Ministries is really blessed to be able to come into the churches and share the Word of God. And I really look forward to this church each and every time I come. I don't just say that. I say that with meaning. Today's message is a powerful message. And I want you to really grasp the title. The title says, The Leprosy of Naaman. Okay, the leprosy of Naaman. Now, before I go any further, would you please bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Father God in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would use me as your instrument, your vessel, Lord, and put the words in my mouth you want your people to hear. Feed us, Lord, that we may be nurtured and strengthened, for faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Please heal our unbeliefs, forgive us of our shortcomings, forgive us for our sins, and cleanse us, each one of us, of our leprosy, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Leprosy in the Bible is symbolic for sin. We all remember the story of Miriam, right? <clears throat> Moses' sister. When she had envy in her heart toward Moses' wife, what happened to her? What was God's judgment against her? Leprosy. It was a sign to all of Israel what leprosy looks like to God. Now, if you would, and I've done the sermon before on leprosy, but at the first year, I always like to touch on this message. And I wanted to use the story of Naaman because it is all to the glory of God. Amen? But I want us to first turn to the book of Isaiah, if you would, chapter 1. We're all very familiar with this. I want to take a few verses from here just to get us a head start on the sermon, to build the foundation, okay? We're going to be looking at verses 5 and 6 first, and then we're going to go 16 through 20. Chapter 1 of Isaiah Verses 5 and 6, and then we're going to do 16 through 20 as well. Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Verse 16, wash you make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land." But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now, brothers and sisters, we need to take this very seriously because we are all like sheep who have scattered. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there are some times we don't recognize just how simple our nature can be, even in our thoughts toward others, and in our actions by just passing by those who are in need. When we know better, when we know better, God doesn't weak at ignorance when you know better. He only weaks at ignorance when you don't know. He wants us to learn to do well. But He wants us first to be able to what? To come to Him. Reason with Him. Reason with Him. Let Him search our hearts. You know, as the psalm says, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be what? Any evil ways in me and lead me in the way, what? Of everlasting. What a way to start off the year to know that we must come first to God with everything we have. God wants everything, even the smallest of matters, He wants us to put that before Him and lay it before Him. Let God plan out our lives. You see, oftentimes, and I'm guilty of this too, I like to take matters in my own hands. And when I do, I see where I fall short of the glory of God. Because I didn't go to God first. You know, we rely upon God to give us the very breath that we breathe every day and to have the life that we have. Why would we not depend on God with even the smallest of our matters and problems? Amen? Are you with me, church? Now, if you would, let's turn to 2 Kings in chapter 5. Let's read the story of Naaman. 
It is truly to the glory of God, this story is. And I'm going to tell you something. It says a lot from the very beginning. Here we go. Verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. In other words, he was what? A sinner. He was living in what? A heathen nation. Now, does God look upon everyone and work with everyone where they are? Does He not bring circumstances into their life to bring them to repentance, to bring them to the knowledge of God, to bring them into His glory? Amen? So the leprosy of Naaman was to God's glory because upon his return, he would be what? A witness. When we come to church and we receive the food, the manna, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Starting with the Sabbath school lesson all the way through the sermon of the afternoon. We're to take what has been read to us, a thus saith the Lord, and it is written, and go home and study to show ourselves approved and unashamed before God. Rightly able to what? Divide the word of God. Share the word of God with others. Now, this is where it really gets interesting. And the Syrians had gone out by companies, and it brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now here is this little maiden. She's been taken captive. Basically, she's basically what? A slave. And she becomes a witness for the word of God. Now, God has His prophets in the time. He always has His prophets for our time and need. Do we not have an end-time prophetess that has already shared light with us? It's the lesser light that shines upon what? The great light. It gives us a better understanding of what the will of God is. God always tries to help us where we are. He tries to make it very, very simple for us. You know, it's amazing how many people pass by and, know, and don't notice and take notice of the fourth commandment when it says remember? The only one that says remember is the very one people struggle with the most. God said remember and they struggle with it. When God says remember something, He wants us to what? Remember. And to focus on what He said to remember. A thus saith the Lord and it is written is the very aspects that brings what? The sanctification in our lives which is the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. But how can we have the Holy Spirit unless we ask? You know, when the Scripture says, if we, being evil parents, know how to give good gifts to our own children, how much more will our God in heaven give us the Holy Spirit when we ask? Do we ask for the Holy Spirit every day? Do we ask for the former rains to fill our cups so that when the latter rains come, our cups overflow it? Brothers and sisters, this is the day and time to draw near to God. And although we all have our struggles, and look, I don't have to go no further than look in the mirror at myself. But I know that when I go to my knees and I present it to God, even though I stumble and fall along the way, He's going to what? Bring healing, and eventually I'm going to walk upright and eschewth evil just like Job. That's our goal. That is our goal. That's to the glory of God. And along the way, we become stronger and stronger as we become witnesses for God no matter what our circumstances may be. This is where I really admire this little mistress. Let me tell you what it says here from Prophets and Kings, page 245. The conduct of the captive maid, the way that she bore herself in that heathen home, is a strong witness to the power of early home training. There is no higher trust than that committed to fathers and mothers in the care and training of their children. Parents have to do with every have to do with the very foundations of habit and character. By their example and teachings, the future of their children is largely decided. Now, brothers and sisters, are we all children of God? Are we not the sons and daughters of God? Should we not sit as little children at the feet of Jesus to learn what He has to teach us through the Word of God? He says when we become like children, then we're able to be what? Taught. We need to have hearts of children when we come to God 
asking of the Father to teach us His ways. Amen? Now she goes on to say in verse 3, And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid, that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, and 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of raiment. You know, clothing was a big deal back then. We don't realize just how important clothing was to the people. We take it for granted because we have it in every store, whether it's a thrift store or whether it's into one of the other stores we shop in. There's clothing all around us. But in those days, clothing was very important, and it was valuable, just like salt. Many of the Roman soldiers used to get paid with salt because salt was a preservative. As long as they had salt, they were able to what? Have food and preserve their food. It was very important. Salt is something we take for granted. And sometimes we take too much of it in for granted. Amen? We've got to lay off of some of that. Too much salt's bad either which way the wind blows, right? So the king sends Naaman to Israel with this letter. And it goes on in verse 6. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man do ascend unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Now, hello. The king of Israel has the opportunity to be a witness for God. He knows Elisha is in that territory. Not Elijah, but Elisha. He knows that God works miracles through this man. Yet he has forgotten how God has worked through Israel. Because why? Because Israel is still under what? Bondage because of their wayward ways against the Lord. Amen? So there's rebellion there. Now, you would think that the king would automatically say, let me get a hold of the prophet we have here. But instead, he rents his clothes and then looks and points error at the king of Syria as if to say, look at him. He's causing a quarrel with us. He wants to war with us. You know, oftentimes we look as if when people ask us of something, as if, whoa, you're way out of your means. Why ask of me this? What am I able to do for you? The problem is, well, at this point in time, we should be looking to God for what we can do for someone else. Nothing is impossible with God. Look at what he did with Jonah, even though Jonah was rebellious. He was able to do what? Send him into Nineveh, even though he didn't want to go. And he went the hard way. Many of us go the hard way. But to the saving of 60,000 souls. One man. 60,000 souls. What do you think that God can do with this church? With his last day church. I'm not referring just to this church. I'm speaking to all the churches. What can God do through us? His hands and feet. We are the living stones. He is the cornerstone. He is our foundation. He is our shelter. Should we not as a church look to God for our answers? Instead of pointing fingers at wherever we would like to blame? You know, that's much in the means in which the lesson we were taught this morning. We are to leave the results to God. When we're asked of God to do something, it is a command that we do it. And when we trust and obey, God blesses us, doesn't He? And we really, we leave the results in God's hands. Now listen to this, verse 8. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? In other words, have you forgotten? Do you not serve God anymore? That's what he might as well have said, right? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses 
and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But now listen carefully. But Naaman was what? Wroth. And went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. In other words, he's looking for the sure pill cure. We're looking for that cure, that automatic. You know, at the first year, you know how much money is made off of memberships to gyms because everybody's looking at losing weight at the first Everybody makes the commitment, I'm going to lose the weight at the first year. Now, I'm the first one to admit, I picked up a few pounds over the holidays. But I'm not going to go to some miracle pill. I'm not going to go join a membership. I know what I need to do. I need to get back to the diet that the Lord commanded that we eat from. And I know that automatically with that and the exercise and sunshine and the water, I know that my body will return to what it should be. Praise God. Amen? Praise God. But now there's a problem here. In verse 12, look how Naaman compares the fact to the other two rivers versus the Jordan. Because you see, the Jordan River at this time, it looks kind of muddy. It looks dirty. It's not to his pleasing. Now, it says, are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now, why? Well, if you do your research and your homework on these two rivers, these were also places where shrines were set up for other idols and gods. God didn't want him to go there. He wanted him to see the miracle that he was going to do for him. We all need to know that when we go to God, we can expect miracles in our life. We all need to remember this too. Very importantly, and I do remind this to people when they're sick and ill or they've been stricken with cancer, God forbid. But I tell them, remember, God has promised us an expected end. Jeremiah chapter 29. That expected end is what? Life eternal. For these bodies of corruption will take on what? Immortality. When He comes, we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And I hope that we're all alive to see Him come in the clouds. Amen? I want to see that day. I want to see Jesus come. I want to see His glory come. And that's not to put anyone down who's died in Christ. They're going to be, what? The dead in Christ, what? Rise first. They rise first. And then we who are left alive, who have been alive here, are caught up in the air and joined up with them to be with our Lord forevermore. Praise God. Praise God. The special resurrection for the dead. Amen. So, he's in a rage. It didn't fit his prescription of what he wanted for himself and his healing. He wanted a quick way of healing. He wanted an easy way out. We all look for the easy way out. In our stewardship, too. Some of us could do much more than what we do, and we don't. And I'm not speaking of finances only. I'm speaking of our time. Remember, and I'm going to say this again and again. You're going to get tired of hearing me saying it. But we are measured in our stewardship. And that timeline is your life. And we're going to give account on how we invested the time that God gave us in life with others. Because it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about others. What have we done to grow the church? Why do we always like to point our finger at the conference or point our finger at the pastor or the elders when we ourselves own it too? We are to be witnesses just like this little maiden was. How powerful of a witness she was. Not only did she give the message of hope to someone who was stricken with leprosy, and when you had leprosy, that was a death sentence, by the way. You know, God bless these missionaries that go into these leper camps. They have to sign their life away. Leprosy is very contagious in stages. And there are missionaries that will sign on the dotted line, so to speak, and give their life to be witnesses to these lepers, knowing that they, too, have a strong possibility of getting leprosy themselves. But the leprosy I want to bring to the front is sin. 
the sin we have in our own lives, in our own personal walks. You know, we look at the news and we hear these horrible crimes, and they're horrible. Absolutely horrible. And we can easily judge that. And we want justice for it. But how do we look in the mirror at ourselves and say, I have this sin in my life and I, 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 I can't deal with it no more. I'm out of control with it. I need to give it to God. It might be the simplest of sins. You know, envy is one of the worst sins there is. Envy began in heaven, jealousy. But gossip is horrible too. God hates gossiping. When you have gossip in a church, it's like having termites inside the walls. Eventually it what? Eats away the structure and it crumbles and falls down. Leprosy of sin. The leprosy of Naaman, we could put the place in there and say the leprosy of Buddy. The sins that Buddy has that I need to deal with, and the only way I can deal with that is to give it to God and ask God to work His way through me. We have the prescription. We have the antidote. We have Jesus. He is the cure. We go to Him and we lay it on the line. And if we stumble and fall along the way, don't give up. Continue to pray. Press your petitions. Come boldly to the throne, so to speak, through the righteousness of Christ. Not in your own strength. You have nothing. We have nothing but these filthy rags. Come to the Lord. Lay it on the line. Verse 13. I love this part. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. Now God worked through these servants, did he not? He's trying to stop Naaman from missing his blessing. How many times have you seen roadblocks in your way to stop you from missing the blessing that God wants to give you? I've been guilty of it. We've all been guilty of it. When we get to heaven, we're going to see just how many blessings we left on the table that we ignored because we decided to keep on going. Our things just didn't suit us just right. The church just wasn't right today. The speaker was boring. Or it went on and on and on and on, like I do. <laughs> That's what we do. We're preachers, right? What would you do? What would you do if Jesus was here preaching to you and he spoke for 10 hours? Would you stay? I'd faint. I'd faint, amen. But would you stay? Or would you say, I'm hungry, I'll see you later, Jesus? What would you do? Good question to ask, amen? No, I'm not trying to get permission to speak to you for 10 hours. I could. I would love to. I'd love to preach. But God forbid I'd be stoned. <laughs> I don't mean that harshly. I love y'all. But um, it's, just, it's just a beautiful story. It's, it's all to the glory of God because the Holy Spirit's even working through His own servants who don't know the true God to say, hey, look, lower your pride. You have leprosy. He's, he's giving you an antidote. Try it. You know what does the Bible say? Taste and see what? How good God is. When's the last time you went to the well to taste and see how good God is? He can bring cures. Verse 14. Then when he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan. I love that number seven, don't you? Seven is the number of what? Completeness. Perfection. The Sabbath brings perfection to the week that was horrible even. Amen? Amen. Then when he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Listen to what it says in Prophets and Kings, page 249. It says, The faith of Naaman was being tested, while pride struggled for the mastery, but faith conquered. And the haughty Syrian yielded his pride of heart and bowed in submission to the revealed will of Jehovah. When's the last time you went to your knees and surrendered your heart? You realize that our hearts, well, no, 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 you know what? I'm not going to say it. Let's, let's hear what the Bible has to say. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Verses 9 and 10. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. 
Underline this. Highlight this in the Bibles. This defines your heart, my heart. Okay? I'm putting me first on the line. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately what? Wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his what? Doings. Is this not the story of Naaman? Could this not be the story of your life or of your neighbor's life that you pray for every day? Are we forgetting just how powerful intercessory prayer is? Should we not put others before ourselves? Is that not the keys that open up the heavenly gates? Do unto others as you would have done unto you? Why are we missing that message? Why are we missing out on the opportunity to be a witness for the glory of God and see what God will do for you in your life? I've seen God open up church doors from Baptist churches for me, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, community churches, even when I was touring through Wyoming. They didn't know me, but they invited myself and Yuri and Roger to come in and do the whole service for them. And then the whole church came to our tent revival. Was that because of me or Yuri or Roderick or Marissa or the rest of the team? Absolutely no. It was because the Holy Spirit was at work. It was God's will. We were nothing more than the instruments and pleased to be so, just like I'm pleased to be here at the pulpit. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's not something to be taken for granted. When you present yourself as a witness to others, it's powerful. You never know what kind of change that's going to bring in someone's life. I want to remind you, and I know I probably told you this story before, but I'm going to tell you again. There is a book by an Adventist man, Noble Alexander, and it says, I will die free. If you have not read this book, I challenge you to buy it and read it. He was a Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, he was taken captive in Cuba, and he was held there for 22 years, and he went through so much. But there's just one portion of the story that really, really soars high in my mind. And that was the fact that when he was about to die, he was given up on everything. And they put him in this cave where there were other prisoners. This one man came up because he recognized him, and he kept calling his name and calling him and calling him, Noble, Noble. Noble, and he's confused, he's trying to come through, he hears his name being called, and finally he gets focused on the man. He doesn't recognize him at first. He says, don't you remember me? You gave me a Steps to Christ book. And I need your help here to minister to the rest of these prisoners here. That was enough to bring life back into Noble Alexander and to minister the word of God to those other prisoners. And the results? Well, that's in the Holy Spirit's office. Noble will see the results of his ministry through those 22 years of, I want to excuse it, but I'm going to put it in the right principle, of hell he went through. Because he went through it. And brothers and sisters, it's worth your read. You don't know what's ahead of us yet. Amen? Now, let's look at um, uh, Psalms 37, please. Psalms 37. Psalms 37, verses 23 and 24. And please, underline these two verses too. Verses 23 and 24 of Psalms 37 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Come on, witnesses. Are you hearing what the Word of God has to say to you? The steps of a good man are what? Ordered by who? The Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Amen? Amen. Psalm 62. Psalms in 62. Psalm 62. Verses 7 and 8. Psalm 62, verses 7 and 8. Highlight these, brothers and sisters. And God is my salvation and my glory. 
The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a what? Refuge for us. Selah. Amen? So who do we go to? Who do we pour our hearts out to? Why? Because our hearts are what? Deceitful and desperately wicked. When you say, I surrender my heart to you, if you don't ask God to take it, brothers and sisters, you're going to struggle with that. Because we're deceitful and desperately wicked, our hearts are. We were what? Conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity, we're told in Psalms. How serious should we take that? David did. And the reason why he received forgiveness for murder and adultery is because he wept bitterly and repented. When's the last time you wept bitterly and repented for the sins you've committed? I think we've all fallen short of the glory of God there. How did Jesus begin his ministry after he came out of the wilderness of sin for us? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, repent. Very, very clear scripture. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's the first act of obedience when we come to God? Repent. When we repent, that gives God permission to work in your life. Do we need God to work in our lives? Do we need to go down to the Jordan River and dip down seven times? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's go back now. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 15. 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning with verse 15. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Do you hear what he's proclaimed? Through this miracle in his life, he knows. You know, I know, there is a God in heaven for us. Who can be against us when we have God for us? Amen, brothers and sisters? Now, to paraphrase the rest of the story for time's sake, because I hear some stomachs growling out there, we know what took place after that. Elisha said, no, I will take nothing for the Lord's work here. This was not my doings. I didn't heal you. The God in heaven did. It was very purposeful, even though Elisha needed support for his ministry, that he take not from this heathen nation, because then they could think they could buy healing. We can't buy healing. You can't buy salvation. You can't buy forgiveness. You've got to surrender and fully give your heart to God. So the leprosy of Naaman could be the very well the leprosy of Buddy. The sins that I'm clinging to, the sins I have, maybe I need to go to my house and clean out my closet, so to speak. And take out the things that are what? The temptation to me. Oh, brothers and sisters, let me tell you a little something. I was mortally shocked at what I used to see come in from the houses of Adventists that came into the thrift store that they wanted us to sell. I took it and put it in the garbage can. From the short miniskirts to the books they were reading, yes, even the Harry Potters. God forbid, I can't believe that. But it's true. Why? Why? I'm not going to judge that person. That's their shortcoming. That's their sin. They need to come to God and come to an understanding that we don't read and study witchcraft, do we? But our stubbornness is as witchcraft. Our rebellion is. The Bible tells us so. We need to realize that when we come to God, that He is our Creator. He is our Redeemer. And through Him we receive redemption. So when Naaman dips down seven times, can you imagine what he must have felt to know that he was cleansed of his leprosy? You know, brothers and sisters, when I was, had a terrible problem with alcohol and drugs, God was very merciful to me. When I answered to God's calling and I went through a horrible time, but it could have been worse. The withdrawals and that could have been a lot worse than they were. But he saw me through it, and when he cured me of it, I was free. 
There really is true liberty in Christ. When you are broke free from the bondage that you carry around, you don't realize how heavy that yoke is on you. I didn't realize how heavy the yoke of drinking was on me. But when I was cleansed from it, praise God, I felt so much better about myself. I could look in the mirror at myself. I wasn't ashamed when the drugs went away. It was well worth whatever I had to go through, and God was merciful and saw me through it all. Little did I know he had a plan for me to be a pastor and to preach and minister in his churches. I had no idea. God can work miracles for everyone, especially for our neighbors out there. Remember, Naaman could have been seen as her very enemy. Here she was. Nobody likes to hear the word slavery. It's a horrible term. But to actually be taken captive and to know that you're going to be serving these people, but you have so much mercy and love for God that you can't help but speak of the cure that this man could have if he just go to the Word of God. Amen? Now, we realize and we know that as he rode away, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, went after him. Greed, right? It's called entitlement. Does church members sometimes have problems with entitlement? I'm just kind of touching on a few things. I'm trying to get anybody mad at me, so don't stone me when I go out there in the parking lot. But do we have sometimes problems with entitlement, what we think we're entitled to in the church? Or what the church owes us? Why would we think that the church owes us when it's our reasonable debt to God that we witness for Him? Our bodies are the temple of God. We are to be building up the walls of Zion, not bringing it down as all of our positions. We are all to minister. Every single one of us. Brothers and sisters, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 25, 26, and 27. Highlight these, please. Look, brothers and sisters, when I work my Bible, I'm not boasting or bragging, but my Bible is always marked and filled, and I have little marks put in there to what book I can go to in the spirit of prophecy to turn to and look up to get a clearer, more understanding. That's how we study the Word of God. You know, Jesus doesn't mind you writing all over the Bible and highlighting and underlining. That just means you're focusing on it, right? We need to focus on the Word of God. We're living in the last days, people. Verse 25, Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. So if Christ would give His life for the church, should we not also give our life for the church? Should we not be witnesses for the church? Should we not take a personal responsibility in witnessing and inviting others to come to church? You'd be surprised what God can do if you just pray before you go and ask. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened. Seek and you shall find. Amen? It goes on to say, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with what? The washing of water by the word. What happened to Naaman? He was washed by the word of God. Do we need to be washed by the word of God? I need to be washed by the word of God every day. Paul says I die daily. How much more do we need to go and get washed by the Word of God every morning and every evening? That He might present it to Himself, glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's speaking of us. Since we are the flock, we are the lambs of God, and our bodies are the holy temple, we should be without blemish before a world in darkness that we may win souls for Christ. Stop pointing your finger elsewhere. Look in the mirror and point at yourself. That's what I have to do. What kind of neighbor am I to my neighbors? What kind of witness am I? Who have I invited to come to church? What have I done according to the Word of God? Did He not command us all? Go ye therefore what? 
Teach all races. That's what nation stands for, races. Teach all races all that I have taught you. So we're to teach others everything that he has taught us. And then what? They come in, and before you know it, they are baptized. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because all power has been given to who? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he will work with us, and he'll always be with us. Now, I paraphrased all that, but you can go to Matthew chapter 28 and read it for yourself. Let the word of God wash you. Amen? I know you're saying, come on now, buddy. Come on, come on. So here we go. The story of Naaman can be the story for you and I. It is a message of justification because he came as he was to hear the word of God. He struggled with it. We all struggle with it at times. The work of sanctification is when he became obedient and he acknowledged who the true God was. And the glorification was to all God because he became a witness to his own household. He became a witness to a heathen nation. How many souls do you think he won? We won't know until we get to heaven. But I can imagine it started a domino effect because when he came back and cured, don't you believe everybody's eyes got open? Hello? Wow! He said, all I did was obey the word of God. The word of God that was taught to me through his prophet. Are we obedient to the word of God? Do we follow his every command? There is a reason why I wanted that song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. We'll stop fighting with Jesus. We'll stop wrestling with Jesus when we trust and obey. Sometimes we just got to sit down and be still and let God take the reins. Because you know what? When I take things in my own hands, that's when I mess up. How about you? Can we say an amen in the church for that? Amen. amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, I'm glad you're with me here. You haven't gone to sleep yet. We're going to finish up 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. You should know this by heart. If any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creature. The old ways of our life are what? Passed away. I stopped drinking. I stopped doing drugs. Those things are in my past now. And behold, you become what? A new creature. I didn't say I didn't have my struggles. I didn't say I wasn't a sinner. But one day I will sin no more. That's what I believe in. Because one day God will write it in our thoughts and in our hearts and He'll pour out His Holy Spirit on all flesh. Remember, He says He will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. We'll receive according to our faith. Naaman received according to his faith. He struggled with it. He wrestled with the Word of God. But when he went and did it and he came up, can you imagine what him must have felt like then? What a witness he became. Amen? We too can become those same witnesses when we let the Word of God wash us. Finish up here. Last verse of the evening. Of the, I said evening, huh? <laughs> I'm going to let that fall because I already know where we're going. It is the mission statement of Jordan to Canaan Ministries. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It's the mission statement God put upon my heart for Jordan to Canaan Ministries. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. If you go to our website, Jordan to Canaan Ministries, you will see that this is our mission statement. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and reverence. That word fear there means reverence. Respect. Worship. Brothers and sisters, when we sanctify God, that means we're allowing God to take control. The Word washes us, and we live by the Word. We trust and obey. And when we do the closing song, I picked that song, Whiter Than Snow, for the same purpose, that when the Word washes us, we become whiter than snow.
Now, you know I'm going to say a little something before I have the closing prayer, right? Thank you for the vacation. I never call out from preaching, but my daughter gave me a wonderful gift for Christmas, and that was to have a little camping trip for three days. And though it was storming and it was raining, I set up that campsite and was in that camper. And I want you to know something. That Friday night, that storm came and it hit so hard. And the camper I had, I was sitting up on, up on a downslope. So I had it anchored up high here, and that thing was rocking. And I got to thinking about Noah about that time. <laughs> you know, we received eight inches of rain up there at Pollock Pines at that time. I was up there at Ghost Mountain. They said it was eight inches of rain, and the wind was just horrific. And that camper mine was just rocking. And I slept so well. I slept well because I know that I can trust in the Lord. Amen. And you know what? It rained and it rained. You know, I have two big dogs, right? I don't even like to call them dogs. I like to call them my kids. And uh, one's 120 and one's 140. And, you know, they were rocked in that, in that, little, <laughs> in that little camper with me. And when, when we went out to go to the bathroom, oh, it was horrible. We came back drenched, wet. Oh, we were washed. Brothers and sisters, we need to go to the Word of God and get washed. You'll feel clean, and you'll sleep well in every storm that comes around. It don't matter what comes to you in your life in trials and experiences. If we allow the Word of God to have its way in our lives, we will survive, and we'll have that expected end to look forward to, life eternal. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity here today to be a witness for you. And to share your word. For it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. The lesson from Naaman, the leprosy of Naaman, is the leprosy that we need to get rid of in our lives, Lord. The sin in our lives. Lord, take our hearts. Take our hearts, Lord, and create in us a new heart and put within us a right spirit. We pray and we ask in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.